Today, we're going to talk about the history of laugh tracks, the rise, the fall, and how podcasts kind of brought it back from the dead, for better or worse. Welcome to another episode of Catching You Up With... Not how it's okay to die. I'd like to thank the executive producer of this week's episode, David Finkel. Without his big baller support, I'd probably be trying to figure out the actual merits of counting cards in blackjack, and if I could actually get enough of a team that I could trust to go to Vegas with, and actually, like, you know, bring back, like, 20 to 30K at a time, but if we do bigger bets, we could probably bring in bigger hauls, and you really just do that, like, four to six times a year, and you're making pretty decent money. But because of David Finkel, I don't have to do that. Thank you, David, and your big baller support. And if you'd like to become a big baller supporter of this show, you can go ahead and click the Patreon link in the description below. Comment on this video. Like this video. Share this video. So laugh tracks. Why did we do this? The first ever laugh track was actually for radio in 1949 on the Bing Crosby Chesterfield show. This was the kind of stuff that really made your grandma and grandpa slap their knees. They're like, oh, 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 Bing, you got us again. An interesting variable during this time is that people didn't really have a lot of choices when it came to what they wanted to entertain themselves with. Generally speaking, almost everyone listened to the same kind of music, the same kind of radio, watched the same TV shows and the same movies. Today, you have a seemingly unlimited list of categories and channels that you can get your entertainment from whether it's netflix hulu youtube instagram tiktok x hamster what i'm saying is back in the day everyone had like three shows to choose from and radio dominated as a source of entertainment the bing crosby show was one of the first radio shows that wasn't required to be recorded live so the show had a lot more creative liberties than most other radio shows a humorist that's what they called him back then by the name of bob burns was a guest during the show's three-year stint now believe it or not some of this guy's jokes were a little too hot for airwaves come in howdy little lady Howdy, Burns. Hello, Mr. Hello, Jackson. Jackson. Oh, uh, I'd like you to meet our friend, Bing Crosby. Bing Crosby? Say, I'm proud to shake your hand. I admire your singing. I admire your acting. You're a mighty celebrated man. Thank you, sir. And uh, what part of Texas are you from? <laughs> so those jokes didn't make it into the show, but the audience was laughing the hardest at those jokes. So what they did was they just lifted the audience laughing at those jokes and they placed them where the audience wasn't laughing as hard. Pretty sneaky J stuff, if you ask me. <laughs> this was created by CBS sound engineer Charlie Douglas, who eventually created a machine that could play back laughter. Called the Laugh Box, the machine was designed to look like a typewriter. But instead of producing letters when you hit the buttons, it would produce laughter. Before television, if you were going to see a show, it was going to be at a theater, most likely, with a lot of other people. So back in the day when people watched shows, they were programmed to watch them with other people and their reactions, and that affected their reactions. Directors wanted to replicate that experience for TV to keep audiences comfortable by recording the reactions of a live studio audience. You might have realized that laugh tracks have never been used in cinema. This is because until recently, movies were rarely watched alone. If you watched a movie, you were watching it with a theater full of people. You were watching this movie in a movie theater. You see, the laugh track became the other theater goers. You see how this is evolving, right? Pretty crazy. In 1951, the television show I Love Lucy was the first TV show to utilize a live studio audience. 20 years later, Cheers also used a live studio audience. These audiences worked jointly with production, at times forcing laughter after reshooting scenes multiple times. Producers eventually realized that adding in pre-recorded laughter was way easier and more cost efficient. Like I have such a distinct memory of this and I think because of copyright issues or something, but the Drew Carey show had one distinct laugher in their laugh track. You hear him in the back going, ha ha, ho ho, ho ha. It was such a distinct laugh and it was honestly such a key factor for me liking the Drew Carey show. I was like, I want to hear that one guy laugh like a fucking idiot, which boy, 
That really went full circle, didn't it? Now, you might be wondering if a laugh track or a live studio audience actually adds to a show. Does it make it funnier when you hear an audience laugh? Does it make it sadder or more emotional when you hear them go like, oh, you know, when Steve Urkel talks back to some bully or something? The answer is yes for certain shows. Let's look at this clip from Friends where the laugh track was taken out. Hi. Hi. One uh, vegetarian pizza. It's 12.15. Uh, by the way, if it makes you feel any better, uh, I happen to like eight-year-old boys. What? Oh, uh, I mean, you said you thought that your hair looked like an eight-year-old boy's, and I'm, I'm just saying I like it. The, the hair. Thanks. Now, here's another example of that. Here's the Big Bang Theory without a laugh track. Nothing makes beer taste better than cool, clear Rocky Mountain spring water. Where are the Rocky Mountains anyway? Philadelphia. Really? I thought they were out west someplace. Think about it, Raj. Where did the movie Rocky take place? Philadelphia. Okay, now I get it. So this is the plan. From now on, we're just going to hide out in here to avoid the shamey. I'm very comfortable here. <laughs> Penny, dear, why don't you shoot another silver bullet my way? Get one yourself. Ooh, somebody's been taking bitchy pill. The comedic timing of the Big Bang Theory and Friends was written around and for a laugh track which is why it looks so weird without one. It doesn't feel natural or genuine, but it does still do the trick at times. Ha <laughs> ha! In plays or stand-up comedy shows, the performers factor in the element of laughter into their shows. Like, I know that there's definitely comedies that I've watched where if I watch it by myself, I'm laughing way less than if I watch it with someone. Ha <laughs> ha! Laugh tracks are a more forced version of this, but the concept is still the same and it still kind of works. I mean, look, there is a really good chance that you've enjoyed shows with a laugh track as much as you might say that you hate shows with laugh tracks. That 70s show was solid. Two and a half men was a banger. I mean, Seinfeld, come on. How could you not like Seinfeld? Who cares if there's a laugh track? Seinfeld is Seinfeld. Ha ha! To this day, Friends still brings in $1 billion in revenue per year for Warner Brothers. There is no doubting the success of some of these shows. Is it purely because of the laugh track? No. But some shows can find success using a cheap trick that other shows might not. As comedy began to evolve, it honestly wouldn't even make sense to add a laugh track. Comedy is becoming quicker. Setups and punchlines are becoming more subtle. Stuff like Arrested Development, Curb Your Enthusiasm, which is kind of like a version of Seinfeld without a laugh track, but also The Office. Look at this version of The Office with a laugh track. Strike, scream, and run. All right, let's try it. Yes! <laughs> that is Northern Lights Cannabis Indica. No. It's marijuana. Hey, New York. Happy Halloween. Thanks. My costume's getting a lot of attention. It's kind of wild to me that a cheap trick developed in the 40s is still being used 60, 70, 80 years after it was incepted. And today, laugh tracks are becoming way less common. There are people that see right through laugh tracks and say, hey, you know what? Fuck you and your manipulation. I'll decide when I laugh. And because you have a laugh track, I'm not watching your show. One of my closest friends has refused to watch any episode of Seinfeld because it has a laugh track. Wake up, Warren. It's a fucking banger of a show, bro. And these days, telling your audience now is the time to laugh just doesn't quite work the way it used to. People watch it by themselves and they just kind of get used to it. I mean, for anyone out there that was a huge fan of Arrested Development like I was, if it had a laugh track, you would miss so many jokes. Still to this day, I will watch that show and I will find new layers of jokes that I hadn't even noticed. And if it had a laugh track, who knows how distracting that would have been from the pure comedic genius of that show really was. At the end of the day, people watch shit alone more often than ever and they've gotten used to it. Now, this doesn't mean that an element of someone laughing in, let's say, 
a podcast isn't appreciated. Laughter from anyone that wasn't on-screen talent kind of started acting like an immediate feedback system to podcast hosts, co-hosts, and guests alike. So now is probably a good time to explain how loud my fucking laugh really is. Like, I'm pretty new to having an Apple Watch, right? Maybe one and a half, two years I've had it. But a cool feature that it has is when you're in a room that's way too loud, it tells you, hey, man, if you withstand this decibel level for another minute, you're going to have permanent hearing loss. And that shit would go off all the time while I was recording YMH. All the time. Now, if you're a fan of the show, you've probably heard me talk about it before, but I used to work at Machinima, and I was one of the co-hosts of a daily live streaming VR show that we did. We kind of shared a warehouse space with like a couple other production crews that were all under the Machinima umbrella. And, you know, there was the VR Power Hour where I worked, and then there was the DC Comics Daily right next door to us. I was laughing a lot, and my laugh is piercing. And one day I got a talking to by the executive of the production studio that was like, hey, buddy, you got to stop laughing so hard. <laughs> and I, I looked at him. I was just like, fucking blow me, dude. Like, I don't know. I don't know what to tell. I don't know how to laugh softer. I don't know how to control my laughter. And also, fuck you for laugh shaming. No, I know my laugh is atrocious to a lot of people. But the problem is, is that my laughter was causing production problems. So, you know what their solution was? to build a soundproof quarter of a million dollar wall between our recording space and the other recording space. And after $250,000, you know, we found out that my life is able to pierce through $250,000 worth of construction. Oopsie whoopsie. Another thing about working at Machinima is that while I was co-hosting this VR show daily, it was all improvised. None of it was scripted. We had basic beats that we were trying to hit or like, oh, we're going to play this game today. But all of it was more or less improvised. And I knew if I heard the producers laughing from the control room, it was immediate feedback. And I knew, oh, shit, Dan's laughing. Keep going in this lane, right? Oddly enough, that's also how comics find out if the jokes that they're writing are funny. They write them. They perform them in front of an audience, and the audience will either laugh or not laugh. And that will tell you if you're onto something or not. So now fast forward a little bit, and I've now gone full-time at YMH Studios. We're building out the studio, we're building out the control room, but by accident, we kind of recreated a comedy club feedback system for our guests and for our hosts. Because as we built the studio, we had to cut what is not in the industry uh, into the wall uh, what it's known as a rat hole, which is just taking a saw and cutting out a hole. And, and this was just so that, you know, all of the cables coming from the mics, uh, from the playback systems on sets and and what, whatever it is, can all feed into the control room through this rat hole. And although cables are going in and out, my laugh was also projecting outwards. And I told you how a $250,000 wall was no match for my voice. Neither is a super shitty drywall with a hole in it that's probably like six inches by 12 inches where my laugh could just completely bleed through and anyone on set can hear me laughing. Even if I'm just like, <clears throat> all that shit could be heard on set. So with that, we had accidentally recreated the feedback system that comics would normally have in a comedy club. Oopsie whoopsie. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to comics that, you know, had guested on other podcasts that they were like, honestly, I'm really anxious for this episode that I guested on to come out. Like, I, I, I don't know if I did well. I don't know if I bombed. And I'm just nervous. When you recorded shows at YMH Studios and you heard the guy with the obnoxious laugh, let her rip, you had an inclination. Maybe I'm doing OK. I mean, there were so many times where I had seen this reaction. I don't know how often this was actually captured on camera, but whenever we would start a guest segment and the guest heard my laugh for the first time, their head would snap back in my direction and realize, oh shit, there's someone here that I can make laugh? Fuck yes. And then they would start going harder and whenever they'd hear me laugh, they would go harder in that lane. It accidentally served as a tool for the guests the hosts, and sometimes even the audience. Because like I said before, sometimes I'll watch comedies by myself and I'll just kind of exhale through my nose a little bit more at the funny stuff, like, <laughs> right? But if you're with a friend and you hear him go, <laughs> or her, <laughs> that might cause you to go, ha ha! 
or you know whatever your genuine laugh sounds like but it starts a chain reaction and if you have contagious laughter it'll cause other people to start laughing too kind of crazy how all this shit's coming together huh i mean imagine if you're watching the new tim robinson show or the new nathan fielder show if you're watching it by yourself yes you're gonna find it funny yes there's gonna be times where you're dying of laughter but if you're watching it with a pal Odds are you're going to be laughing way harder for way longer during the duration of that show because you're recreating the theater experience. You're watching a show with other people. So their reactions are now influencing your reactions as well. So back to podcasts, I feel like the producers laughing or the people behind the camera laughing adds a layer to any show. I mean, I haven't talked about it in a while, but let's talk about the good old days of Comptown back when it was Nick Mullen, Adam Friedland, and Stavros Halkis. I would definitely see comments complaining like, oh, Stavros' laugh is so annoying. But take that away, and it's a completely different show. Stavi's reaction in some of these clips honestly make it for me. Classic Joe. Joe. Yeah. Ooh, <laughs> why wow, sorts. I just don't think six million is a reasonable number, Mr. He Coffee. said the Holocaust didn't happen. <laughs> Did you heard him say it, folks? <laughs> He's Holocaust revisionist. He thinks it happened. Where are week. the graves? There ain't a, he said there's not any the graves. You can't find a single one of them. All they have is the museum. Seems like there's more museums than Jews, even. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a couple examples of Tim Dillon making his past podcast producer laugh, Ben Avery. I was born before 9 11, and then I learned that 9 11 wasn't real. So, yeah, we're never gonna. Yeah, I'm not doing your new dance on TikTok, okay? I watched the towers fall and then found out they were holograms. <laughs> and by the way, Ben Avery has a great laugh, but he's also a great source for laughter. If you like having a good time, watch Ben Avery's show called Lemon Party and also support it on Patreon. Ha ha! So yes, Ben Avery's, Stavi's, even my laugh can be boiled down to like, oh, well, that's a fucking laugh track. And yes, they were the laugh tracks of their respective shows, but it worked on multiple levels that didn't really occur in broadcast before. No, you know what? Maybe whose line is it anyway? Yeah, like improv shows. Yeah, maybe whose line is it anyway? All right, that's the only one. Another show with Drew Carey. Ha <laughs> ha! I truly believe that podcasts hold the final evolution of laugh tracks. The biggest complaint with the traditional laugh track is that it's forced and it's not genuine. But in podcasting, you can have the structural importance and timing importance of a laugh track without it being disingenuous. Granted, a lot of people have said that I do force my laughter, but... I don't know, man. I've laughed pretty genuinely hard at a lot of things. A lot of things that most people haven't. There's humor all around us. I'm just able to sense it better than some. <laughs> Why am I grabbing tits? I mean, look, it's all pretty fascinating if you actually sit down and analyze where it started, where it went, it going away, it coming back, and it's just a wild ride. Is this the last evolutional stop for laugh tracks? What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Do you hate my laugh? Ah, fuck you. Don't tell me. Ho, 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 ho! Wow. What a fun episode of catching you up with. On a doll. It's go, it's. We learned, we laughed, and we laugh tracked. Isn't that cool how we do that? I'd like to thank everyone that you're seeing on screen right now. Uh, they are the producers of this show. And without their support, it would be much harder to consistently and regularly put this show up at the level that I do. And if you'd like to become a producer of this show and show your support, you can click the Patreon link in the description below. Any level of support helps. Now would be a good reminder to comment, like, and subscribe. But look, I like you and I love you and I appreciate you watching this episode. And, you know, even though that this episode was super educational and informative, I would also like to remind you. This is a totally unconfirmed news. See you next week.